Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Thursday, September 15th, 2022, and today we are going to be talking about the state of Georgia and a brand new poll from Quinnipiac University that is reverting back from away from the other pollsters that have been in this race. Emerson, Trafalgar, Fox 5, and Insider Advantage all together have come up with the conclusion that Herschel Walker is leading by three points, two points, one point, all across the state of Georgia, what is expected to be, potentially speaking at least, one of the most competitive races of the 2022 election cycle. Now, I don't doubt the possibility that Walker does win this race. As of right now, though, I am saying that I do believe Warnock does win very narrowly. My forecast so far has shown that the Democratic Party uh, has been narrowly in advantage across the state, at least according to my estimations over the past few months. Ever since we moved on from the state, uh, you know, around the June time frame, I've had the Democrats leading in the state of Georgia. Now, I don't think that this race is going to be a six-point race either. The purpose of this video is not to solely highlight the Quinnipiac University poll, but we've already made one, talking about the past three polls that have been in this state. Now, there is a bit of a history that says that the Democratic Party in the state of Georgia is overestimated by Quinnipiac, but also history that tells us that the Republican Party is extremely overestimated too as well, in addition to how Quinnipiac overestimates Democrats uh, from Fox 5 Insider Advantage. Emerson, Trafalgar, these are all polling companies that have missed their mark in the past election. Now, Quinnipiac University's poll, though, does come as a bit of a difference from the rest that we have seen, because prior to these polls that we have seen, you know, the rest of them showed that Warnock was ahead. And you're actually starting to see a little bit of a flip here, where Quinnipiac, back in the, earlier this year, showed Walker ahead by one point, and then Warnock ahead by 10 points. It was such a significant swing, and now it's down to six, point, six points, but Fox 5 Insider Advantage had Warnock up by three. Now they have Walker up by three. Emerson College, I don't think they did a poll, or they did way back one in uh, April. They showed that Walker was winning by four. Now they have him up by a margin of about two. I mean, these polls really do fluctuate over time. Uh, and, you know, that's just simply how it is. But Quinnipiac's poll in specific really jumps out to me for a multitude of reasons. I think when you take a look at the individual reasons as to how people are voting, how they uh, describe certain candidates and their views of certain candidates really gives you a general idea as to how Democrats are, at least so it seems, taking back this Senate race. When you take a look at the cross tabs here, when you take a look at the extra questions that they ask, it is quite interesting if you ask me. Before we get into it, I want to address that Quinnipiac University back in 2020 was historically inaccurate. They did a poll in early October that showed that President Biden would win by a margin of about seven points statewide. Obviously, that did not happen. Let's see if we can find it here. Right here, Biden said Biden plus seven across the state. This was about a month out before the election. So realistically speaking, they get a little leeway on that front. But in no reality was Biden ever up seven points statewide. And it was one of the larger leads that we had seen for President Biden throughout the entirety of the campaign season. And that's exactly why I say I don't think that Warren wins this race by six. I think that's entirely unrealistic. And based off my own estimation, I have it as one of the narrowest races of this election cycle. In fact, when you go to the 538 forecast, you can see that while Walker and Warnock are in a competitive race and Warnock is leading 56 to 44, it is, is the most competitive Democratic held seat as of right now. Ron Johnson is in a slightly more competitive race, but Walker and Warnock are in an even more competitive race on the Democratic side because Democrats only have a 56% chance. Even in some states with Republican incumbents, for instance, Pennsylvania, John Fetterman has an 83% chance of victory. So you can start to see why uh, you know the state of Georgia really uh, is much more competitive than many, many other states that are uh, were expected to be more competitive than Georgia was this election cycle. Now, also, I already told you this, but Fox 5 Insider Advantage, Emerson College, and Trafalgar are also polling companies that don't exactly get things 100% correct. In fact, back in 2021, in the runoff elections, they all missed it. None of them predicted that the Democrats would win in the state of Georgia in the runoff elections. Emerson said Purdue and Leffler would win by three. Fox 5 Insider Advantage said it would be a tie in both races. And Trafalgar had Ossoff and Purdue in a tie and left their winning by two. Uh, realistically speaking, these polls were wrong. And, and not realistically speaking, practically these polls were wrong and they did overestimate Republican support. So take with that what you will when you look at the numbers that are saying Walker is leading. So all four of these polls have had some severe inaccuracies in the past election. We really don't have uh, that much more major data out of the state. I am intrigued to see what is released from the state of Georgia. But as of right now, Warnock maintains a six point lead, according to Quinnipiac. And for the others, Walker maintains a lead from anywhere from one to three points statewide. I think what we will see is that it averages down to something less than that. I think similar to what the 538 forecast is telling us as well, a margin of about a point or maybe two points at most, uh, considering our national environment.
Now, the state of Georgia was an instant pickup opportunity for the Democratic Party, sorry, the Republican Party after the 2020 election. When you take a look at President Biden's victory over Trump here, uh, you will see that, you know, President Trump only got 49.24% of the vote. In the last election, 2016, he got about 51% of the vote. Joe Biden, on the other hand, got 49.47% of the vote. Hillary Clinton got about, I believe, 45, 46% of the vote, or maybe it was somewhere from uh, 49 to 44. All I know is that President Trump won by about a five point victory back in 2016. Now, seeing President Biden's narrow victory here, you're talking 11,000 votes, 12,000 votes, over 5 million cast across the state. You start to see, you know, exactly how close this race was and why Republicans saw this as an instant pickup opportunity. Now, to be fair, the Senate runoff elections were more lopsided in favor of the Democrats. When you take a look at the special election, you'll see that Raphael Warnock got 51% of the vote to Kelly Loeffler's 49%. So you're talking about a two-point margin instead of a 0.2% margin, but still ultimately very, very close, which meant that any type of environment slightly better than 2020 or slightly better than 2021, the Democrats, technically speaking, would lose Georgia just based off the numbers alone. When we are in a national environment where President Biden's approval rating is about 17 points worse than where it was in the last election in which Raphael Warnock was up, the Democrats are leading in the generic ballot by about six points less than where they were back in 2020, according to the polls, and in terms of the actual margin, about three points less. So when I see that, instant signs and, you know, these red flags are going across saying, you know, the Democrats are not going to win Georgia. But as of right now, I don't know if I buy that narrative. I've already told you that I don't necessarily trust the free polls prior to Quinnipiac. I don't know if I trust the Quinnipiac poll uh, altogether. I think a tie here is probably the safest bet for the polling average right now, even though it's not meant to be that way. I think that's really where we see the state of the race right now. But anything that is increasing from what was a Walker lead is good for the Democratic Party. And I can't ignore the fact that this six-point lead is essentially a resurgence in support for Raphael Warnock compared to the data that we have seen prior. I also think it is something to be said that Warnock is going against extreme expectations and still doing very well. I mean, Warnock individually is a very strong candidate. We knew this from the moment that he was nominated, that he would be potentially able to win an election even after the Georgia regular election, because he was inevitably going to a runoff. He ran against three other candidates, a Democrat and two Republicans and a bunch of other more minor candidates, certainly not the ones that were on the top four. But we knew he would advance to a runoff election and that that race would be competitive. Well, Eventually, it was competitive, but Warnock defied expectations by winning after the Democrats won control of the House, won the presidency, and the only chance of a check and balance on the Democratic president would be the Senate elections. And guess what? It didn't happen. If you go back to 2008, you will see that the Georgia Senate race was extremely competitive, about a two-point race. It headed off into a runoff election. By that time, the Democrats had a 59-seat at majority over the Republican Party, truly didn't care much for the final state. And then you saw the state of Georgia go to the GOP by a margin, I think. Uh, you're talking about uh, double digits. I think you're talking 13-14 compared to the November election, which was two months prior, in which the Democrats lost by about two points. So a very significant difference because the American public pushed back on the Democratic agenda. But they didn't do that with Raphael Warnock. I also think that looking at our forecast right now, something at least is changing. The expectations for the race did narrow up for a brief period of time. The betting markets had Walker above Warnock, but now you're starting to see again a resurgence in favor of Raphael Warnock. This lead for Walker only lasted for about three days and then it went away. The Democrats took it away from them and now are at 55 cents for a yes share. But you can see just how quickly that expectation can change. And this was a result of the new polls that came out of the state, the ones that showed that Walker was leading. But then people started to get a reality check, at least a reality check in the sense that Warnock is still the favorite. And I still stand by that position. Herschel Walker is not exactly the best candidate either. I think if we were to replace Walker with, let's say, a more electable Republican like Doug Collins, or even in a you know best case scenario for the GOP, Brian Kemp, this race would be locked down. And I don't say that to say that, you know, Walker has no chance of victory. Obviously, I would never say that because he has a 44% chance, according to 538, and likely higher. But I do think that the GOP had such an easy race in the state of Georgia. And honestly, they might lose it, which means their next opportunity to get a Senate seat in the state of Georgia would be 2026. That's when John Ossoff is next up for re-election. So you're talking a very long waiting game as more and more voters move into the state. The population grows, Democratic voters, might I add. And these are Democratic voters that are going to be voting down ballot blue unless the Republican Party dramatically changes their messaging and trajectory style down ballot blue, meaning the state of Georgia is only going to continue to get more Democratic. The polling average also beyond the, uh, you know, what we see on Real Clear Politics beside, beyond that tie shows Walker losing by about three points statewide, shows Warnock about 47.8% of the vote. Now, 
what I think we are going to see in this uh, first election is that we do end up, uh, end up going into a runoff election. Georgia law is different now. Runoff elections now need to be held in the first week of December rather than the first week of January. So you're talking about a month turnaround time, which means there's still going to be a lot of discussion about what's going on in the state of Georgia. It's going to be quite a very long, you know, still substantially long, but still uh, also quick turnaround. Two things can be equally true in this case. Uh, people are going to be on the edge of their seats for about a month if it does determine the balance of power, because quite frankly, it might. Now, Georgia could also be in a position where it's the Democratic Party's 51st seat should they win it. Because looking at our forecast right now, Georgia isn't necessary to a Democratic majority. And I say that because Pennsylvania is pretty solid for the Democrats at this point. To think about it from the standpoint of, you know, what is necessary versus what is not, let's go ahead and take my most recent projection, the one where I give the Democratic Party 51 seats, the Republican Party's 49. And you'll start to see why Georgia isn't necessarily the most important state, but definitely would be good for the Democratic Party should they win it. But as of right now, I have the Democratic Party at 51, which means if the Republicans were to take the state of Georgia, well, that would be enough to put it at 50-50, but not enough to get the majority. What they would need is to reverse John Fetterman's lead in the state of Pennsylvania. They would also need to pick up another state if they were to lose Pennsylvania. They would need to pick up Nevada or Arizona or New Hampshire. But at that point, it starts to question, where do you go next? Nevada is probably the only realistic one, but that also means that at that point, the most expansive majority you would see for the GOP is about 51 to 49 as well. The Republican Party, for context, back in 2010, won seven seats from the Democrats and in 2014 won nine seats from the Democratic Party. And they are in a position where the Senate majority is so slim and they have states that they have won on the presidential level in the past. In 2016, Arizona and Georgia both went to the Republican Party and almost went to the GOP back in 2020. And yet they are struggling for victory there. That's not necessarily the best look for the National Party. I think the GOP definitely is in a position where they could be doing a lot better, but quite frankly, they aren't. And I think that also really speaks to how the Republican Party is really unable to win the state of Georgia at this point in time, uh, at least to the expectation that they had maybe a year ago. Even when we saw the election getting closer in Virginia, when we saw President Biden's approval rating starting to dwindle because of his response to uh, Afghanistan, when we saw President Biden starting to deteriorate uh, on the national level when it came down to uh, Biden approval, Biden favorability rating, Kamala Harris approval, Kamala Harris uh, favorability rating, Democratic Party favorability rating, generic ballot, everything was going down, down and down. And at that point, we started to estimate that Georgia would soon be out of reach for the Democratic Party. And you can see that on my map here. When you take a look at the time frame, practically about a year ago, actually, you can look at it a year ago, a year ago from a year and two weeks ago, we had the Republican Party at a 52 to 48 advantage over the Democratic Party. Today, that's 51 to 49. To think that we have the Democratic Party and the Democrats themselves are in a better position now than they were a year ago is fascinating because also Biden's approval rating was better a year ago. The only difference here is that the Democratic Party fielded the right candidates, got their incumbents in, and the Republican Party really messed up. And Georgia is no different. As I said earlier on in this video, if Republicans in Georgia had a better candidate, they would have won this race easily. Take a look at the governor's race. This is what a race looks like in a year as favorable for the GOP as 2022, even with repeat candidates from 2018. There is no major reason as to why Brian Kemp should be performing that much better from where he was back in 2018, except for the fact that 2022 is a different type of national environment. When you have more Republican voters, when you have more anti-Democratic voters and less enthusiasm on the Democratic side, you win races by higher margins as a Republican. Brian Kemp won in 2018, and that should have been the sign that he was going to win in 2022. Stacey Abrams is the same exact Democratic nominee that ran against him in 2018. This is a coinciding race with the Senate race that is showing the Democrats and Republicans in a tie, or in some cases, the Democrats leading by three points statewide, six points according to Quinnipiac University. Quinnipiac University also shows Brian Kemp winning by about two points. So there is a very big and consistent drop off between support for the GOP in the governor's race, support for the GOP in the Senate race, and it comes down to who is running. Voters here are not super comfortable backing Herschel Walker for the U.S. Senate, but they are comfortable backing Brian Kemp. In 2018, they didn't seem too comfortable backing Brian Kemp, but the national environment has shifted. The discussion on politics has shifted. The issue of inflation, the issue of gas prices, whatever it might be, has revitalized interest in the Republican Party in the state of Georgia. But unfortunately for Herschel Walker, he is seemingly unable to tap into that, and that's the downside of nominating someone who, sure, received the Trump endorsement, 
but has no stake in the game to the extent that other politicians do, and also is not nearly as politically savvy as Brian Kemp, Doug Collins, or quite frankly, David Perdue, who even lost back in 2021. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2022 Senate election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all later today.